Good morning, Comeback Period Nation, and welcome back to the Comeback Period. It's Tuesday. You know what that means. I'm Brandon Anderson. I'm your host here on the Comeback Period. It's time for TV ratings and attendance for week three of the UFL. There's been a lot of questions, a lot of concerns coming up with the UFL this past weekend with attendance. How did we do in ratings? Well, let's go ahead and dive right into that from Mike Mitchell himself from uh, Sports Illustrated uh, Fan Nation, UFL side of things. So, the TV ratings are in for week three of the UFL season. Could the league continue to put up uh, viewership numbers against stiff competition? And that, of course, is the question here. So week three ratings, Saturday, April 13th, we go back to the game that uh, me and my wife were at. DC Defenders at the Arlington Renegades at 1 p.m. on ESPN drew 534,000 viewers. This is a very low game compared to what we've seen. Now, let's explain this, though. The DC and Arlington game went up against the Ohio Buckeyes spring football game on Fox that drew 660,000 viewer average um, ship or whatnot. The NHL on ABC, ESPN's college softball and premier soccer on NBC, but most importantly, the tail end of the ESPN telecast went head to head with the Masters on CBS. Now that was a concern a lot of people were talking about in the comments last week, um, heading into week three, that that was gonna be some stiff competition. I had mentioned the Ohio State Um, Buckeye spring game. I'm a huge Ohio State fan. So I knew that that was going to cause some kind of disruption in the TV ratings. I know a lot of people were talking about the Alabama game uh, causing issues for essentially the uh, Birmingham attendance. We'll talk about that. Um, So yeah, that, that is the lowest rating we've seen so far this year. But it went up against a lot of stuff. So we'll, we'll put it there. Um, next up we have, because it just goes up from there. So anyways, so Memphis Showboats at the Birmingham Stallions, 7 p.m. primetime game on Fox, 837,000 viewers. The NHL on ABC was the main uh, competitor for the UFL audience on Saturday night on Fox. For a second straight week, the UFL was number one in the key 18-49 to 49 demo on primetime network television, which is absolutely amazing. These are great numbers in this perspective. Then we move over to Sunday, and a lot of people were actually shocked with these numbers. They were higher than expectations. Houston Roughnecks at the Michigan Panthers at noon on ABC drew 974,000 viewers. And then, of course, the next game that happened right after that one was the St. Louis Battlehawks at San Antonio Brahmas. This was a key matchup this week, and it delivered. Um, 3 p.m. ABC, it got 1.023 million viewers. Um, Again, the final round of the 2024 Masters on CBS averaged 9.589 million viewers. Um, And I heard that was even down from previous years as well, uh, according to sports TV uh, ratings on X. So Mike Mitchell says, after three weeks, the UFL has established a respectable floor in terms of viewership. The newly merged USFL-XFL League is trending toward outpacing the ratings average of the two leagues in 2023. That's good news so far. The ultimate uh, barometer for the league's long-term success is if they can find a new ceiling in popularity. After three weeks, the UFL has produced the best on-field showing of any spring football league since 2020. Like the league's modest attendance figures, uh, it's a matter of getting new people to buy into the the um, product. Now, of course, I will be releasing tonight the video of who, what, when, where, why, and how you can watch the UFL for week four because we have a little bit of a situation for week four, and we've discussed it over time, but we'll get into that tonight. And then the big thing here is we go back to the attendance numbers for week three. So Arlington Renegades, their attendance dropped significantly from that first game, 8,411. Now, we kind of briefly touched base on this back in Arlington, me and Angie, my wife, when we were talking in the press box about this. I didn't go into much detail on it um, because I wanted to save it for this morning. But you can see here, this attendance number has dropped. It was 
it was sparse in attendance when right before kickoff happened, um, we were walking down to get some food and I will tell you, I was super concerned. I'm like, there doesn't even look to be like 2000 people here. Crowds kind of formed in once everyone got situated with food and everything, but it ended up being 8,411. This is a huge drop. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is here. I, I don't know if there is anything going on in Arlington. I know um, uh, potentially the the uh, Dallas Stars were having a game on on Saturday, so that could have been an issue. But overall, this is a major drop for Arlington. I think this is their lowest attendance in franchise history. Um, so we'll we'll continue to see. Their games are every other weekend at home. So. Um, that's kind of been the trend for their schedule, and we'll see where it goes. Their next game is against San Antonio, and it'll be a night game um, or primetime game on the 20th. So we'll see at that point. Um, I, I'm still not sure if I'm going to be at that game or not. Um, debating there's some uh, scheduling conflict with the flights I booked that I may not be able to even stay for the whole game if I went, and that kind of doesn't set well with me. So anyways... We've got that game. Then we have the Birmingham Stallions. This is a big game we were waiting for to see what the attendance was for this. So the attendance for Birmingham was 12,265. Not bad. I think this is decent numbers. It's not like significantly low. Um, And from what Mike Mitchell uh, had said about the attendance and stuff is that He actually knew the attendance, the official attendance for the USFL in 2023, Um, but actually, like, I don't know if he signed or made an agreement with the league and with Fox that he would not release those publicly. So they're out there somewhere. I don't think they're somewhere on the internet, but people have them, obviously. And what he said is these numbers are significantly better than what they did last year. So... That's good. I I mean, that's all we kind of want to hear here. Um, I think that there needs to be more. I knew they weren't getting the 17,000 that they got on opening night in 2020 against the uh, New Jersey Generals for the inaugural game of the USFL. I knew that just was not going to happen, but they came close. I, I, I think that... This is a start. I I would love to see Birmingham's crowd grow as time goes on, but we'll see. Next up, we have Michigan. This was uh, another drop. Uh, Michigan had 6,952 in attendance. Uh, This is a gradual tank, kind of what we're seeing here, uh, drop in Detroit. It probably doesn't help that they had three back-to-back games. Um, but the Panthers are uh, doing very great. I, they are two and one. That game was absolutely amazing. Um, something to kind of keep an eye on there. Um, I think they are on the road, if I'm not mistaken, for the next two weeks. Um, but it'll be interesting to see when they come back if they are doing just as good as they are. Um, if that attendance record does go up. Now, I know a lot of people are like, oh, they need to get out of NFL markets. They need to get out of Ford Field. You know what? this point, they need to stay consistent. They don't need to move anywhere. I think we've talked about this uh, beating a dead horse at this point. Stop changing things about markets. It's never going to allow you to grow. If the attendance drops, the attendance drops. You need to figure out a new way to get a crowd in there. I I told, I was talking to Sam in Arlington. We went out um, to eat, met up with him after the game or whatnot. And my thing was, If you know what banana ball is, which is a different form of baseball, um, whoever, and I have both the guy, the owner's books or whatnot about how he runs business and all that type of stuff. People need to start contacting this guy. They, They have sold out every single banana ball game for the past like four years straight and their attendance record is insane. I'm not saying the change football to be like banana ball at all. What I'm saying is they need to figure out how he markets these teams um, because they just announced the other day they're introducing a third team into the Banana Ball League or whatnot. So, again, if you're familiar with Banana Baseball and their league, you kind of know where I'm going with this. They need to figure out how to get these markets, and maybe it is getting local ownership, 
getting teams to live in those cities, practice events every week, things like that. I think the league's doing a decent job of that to the extent of it. Uh, but yeah, Michigan suffered on this one, but still not a bad crowd. They were loud on TV and whatnot. So then we move over to the final game, which is San Antonio, 11,790. This crowd was hyped. It was a good crowd. I think they were loud. Um, I'm not, I think these numbers are decent. I, I think that, um, I think that Reed from the Mark cast yesterday said it best on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it, of that if 10,000 can be the range of attendance for the UFL and that's their average and their goal is 10,000 per game, we're good. I think that would be a great set. Um, but again, you're seeing market like Michigan at Ford Field drawing numbers of what the Vegas Vipers were getting last year that everyone was having a panic attack about. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I think there's there's a lot to be said there with marketing. I think they're doing a, de- a much better do- job with marketing than last year. But they've got to figure out this attendance. And we'll we'll dive more into the attendance um, in a future video or whatnot. But overall, I think it was a good weekend for the UFL. Um, the number of the TV ratings, obviously, DC was lower. But I, I think that's because they had a lot of competition going on. On all those prime networks, every single network, like over-the-air broadcast, Fox, ABC, CBS, um, NBC, they were all airing sports at the exact same time. So that's a huge thing. And Ohio State is a massive team. I'm surprised it only got 660,000 660, viewership. I, I'm surprised it didn't get higher than that, to be honest with you. Like, that is a huge thing. And I mean, their crowd, their attendance was uh, nearly sold out for that spring game. So, yeah, it's a big franchise in in college football along with Bama along with Michigan Michigan's uh game is on this upcoming Saturday which is what we'll talk about in the actual video of who went when where why and how to watch the UFL in week four because there is two games going head to head a regional game uh, they're considering a regional game um for the UFL so kind of like Going back to good old XFL 2001 times where two games were airing in prime time at the exact same time. And it was based on where you lived of what you saw. Um, that'll be an issue, um, but it's due to the fact of some TV time. Um, from my understanding, it's also due to venue contracts. Um, but we'll get into that in that video. Um, and then I want to go ahead and go into the breaking news that we found out yesterday. Um, this comes from none other than Mike Mitchell. I know James Larson, Anthony Miller. There's a lot of people that covered this yesterday, and everyone wants to take credit for it. I'm going to give it to the three that I know Essentially, I saw it first from, um, but this comes from Mike Mitchell. According to sources, San Antonio Brahma's quarterback Chase Garber suffered a season-ending injury in Sunday's game against St. Louis. Um, although full details are not available at the moment, it is believed that Garber sustained um, the injury on a late hit by uh, Battlehawks defensive tackle uh I believe it's Perfaza Jr. in the third quarter. Uh, Garbers was off to a great start this season for the uh, Brahma's offense, leading them to 2-1 and one record, completing 70% of his passes for 586 yards and six touchdowns, so only one interception. The Brahma's currently have uh, Quinton Dormady and Tom Flacco on their depth chart, but are expected to add another quarterback in the coming days. Now, Kind of a follow up from this, we did hear that it could have been the injury was potentially suffered at the last part of the game was kind of the update. Um, James Larson, who was at the game um, on Sunday, did see that say that he did see him uh, carrying his uh, wrist with ice on it as they were leaving the stadium. So again, it's it's a very sucky thing to see that this injury bug continues to hit the UFL left and right, and especially the San Antonio Brahmas. They have had the worst luck. They had a huge, huge injury report heading into the game this past weekend. We talked about it here on the channel, and it continues to happen. I feel so bad, and one thing James Larson did note is there is still a possibility 
that Garbers could come at, back by the end of the year, um, but he is for sure on the IR list for at least five weeks, which is the minimum, and then we'll kind of see where it goes from there. But it is most likely that he is out for the season, which is a huge shame. He, I, I think he was the standout quarterback in this league that not a lot of people expected, and he shined. He did his what he needed to do. Um, so we'll see. Time will only tell, but let me know in the comments what you think. Who should the San Antonio Brahmas pick up? I know a lot of people don't like him, and he didn't do very well in the USFL or the XFL last year. But I think under Wade Phillips, because Wade Phillips was on the Denver Broncos with him, there's Cody Latimer on the team as well. I really think they should go out and get Paxton Lynch if he is still available. Um I, I personally like Paxton Lynch. I think he has potential. He just never had a team believe in him and actually give him the opportunity. I know in uh, 2022 with Jeff Fisher and the Michigan Panthers, they didn't really trust him that much, and they, they were switching quarterbacks in and out. He got hurt. Um, when he was with the Orlando Guardians last year, he was decent, and I think he got ended up being traded to San Antonio after the fact, but never played, and then he never re-signed with the league. So I think he could be an option, but I'm sure there's other quarterbacks out there. Um, one quarterback I t can tell you right now who is not going to be signing is Brett Hundley. I actually saw an interview with uh, him yesterday on a podcast um, called, I think it's the, the 48th State. It's the Arizona... Um, it's a podcast that a t-shirt company in Arizona runs or whatnot. And they were talking to Brett Hundley and he was talking about him and his wife are going to travel across the country or whatnot, or not country, the world and going to different, um, places for like a month at a time. But that was starting here shortly. So pretty sure Brett Hundley is not in the option. I know some people were commenting about him coming back. It does not appear he is coming back to the league at all. Um, and I'm pretty sure he got paid a pretty hefty uh, paycheck last year as well from my understanding. So anyways, let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, continue to like, subscribe, and uh, hit that notification button. We've got a full lineup for you as normal this week. I do apologize. I didn't get any post-game recaps for the remaining three games this past weekend because of travel. Once I got back, there was a lot of things that had to be done at home that I just I got to watch the games. I just didn't get to film anything, which is what it is. We'll get back on track this upcoming weekend and try to go from there. But, um, yeah, that's where we're at here. So have a great rest of your week. We'll be back, like I said, later tonight with the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then tomorrow night we will um, – be posting the Pickums uh, video uh, featuring Sam. Sam will be officially back and um, trying to still work on some uh, catching up with Sam, trying to get him back on the show in a prominent way that'll work. Um, I know I've been trying to work with my wife to do the podcast a little bit more, but it's been a little bit harder because she hasn't had the time to watch the game. So it kind of doesn't make much sense to go that route so we'll we'll continue going this is a fluid situation that we're working with we're just trying to get through the season but i appreciate everyone who is watching and uh just hitting up these videos make sure also um i did see that as normal um spring football juice continues to upload those videos for full games make sure you check that channel out because i have not seen any issues with the channel um, it appears that YouTube, the league, doesn't care that there's full games going up. So check them out if you want to see replays and don't have the option to watch them. They're all on YouTube. Just uh, search for Spring Football Juice on YouTube and check them out. I, I'm like, I, I got the fortunate um, because I'm in between switching cable providers at this point right now. I was fortunate enough to get to watch the replays of those games um, that I missed or the... Um, Birmingham Stallions and the Showboats game from uh, Saturday night. I watched some of it at the, at the uh, restaurant slash bar that we went to after the game with Sam. Got to watch some of it, but didn't get to watch the full game. Got to watch the full game yesterday while I worked. So make sure you check that channel out. That's a great option of uh, making sure we support our spring football community. 
and uh, keep building all this up. Make sure you hit uh, check out the Markcast, who is doing a live week three coverage tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern time, I believe it is. Um, so check them out as well and kind of go from there. So have a great one, everyone. We'll see you back here on the comeback period.